Jerusalem is the scene of another attack. This was the day of rage for Palestinian leaders in the Middle of shootings and stabbings in the Middle East. Jerusalem, a city of beauty, sanctity, and hate. Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at The Listening Post. Here are some of the media stories we're getting across this week. Dateline occupied East Jerusalem, and the news coverage that neither side seems happy with. Plus, the cartoons that are microcosms, caricatures, of the Middle East conflict and the way it is reported. Ethiopia decides that these bloggers aren't terrorists after all, and it only took a year and a half to let them out of jail. And binaries the black and white way that news outlets cover stories that are multiple shades of gray. The Palestine-Israel conflict tends to move in cycles. The coverage of it ebbs and flows based on events, the amount of bloodshed, the number of lives lost. Palestinian youths have been revolting once again against an occupation that has lasted almost half a century, attacking Israeli soldiers and civilians. Israel's response has been swift and often brutal. Videos circulating on social media showing the attacks, the aftermaths, and the reprisals are all feeding into the news cycle, fueling the sense of grievance and then the violence. The stabbing of an Israeli soldier by a Palestinian masquerading as a journalist will surely have repercussions for real reporters. There are complaints on both sides over the way this story is being reported, the issues of emphasis and terminology, and there is a fundamental, seemingly irreconcilable argument over context, usually the lack thereof. Knowing, historically, contextually, where to start is job one for journalists trying to cover this story, because where you choose to begin will lead to either one side or the other crying foul. Our starting point this week, at least geographically, is occupied East Jerusalem. Israel is a wired country, a technologically advanced society. Gaza and the West Bank may lack proper infrastructure, but Palestinians are as addicted to mobile phones and digital technology as Israelis are. And it seems that every time there's an attack, the propaganda war between the two sides is escalated on social media. Not just social media, but, but specifically uh, WhatsApp, the, uh, the smartphone application that allows free texting. Everybody has it, and everybody in the media has it. And 24-7, there's not a minute that goes by that there's not a message sent out on one of these to dozens and dozens of members across the country. And what ends up happening is that uh, there, there's a very powerful rumor mill. Things are reported on what's up before they're confirmed. I think that this potentially has an effect to increase this, the, the fear and the tension people are under. There's a lot going on behind the digital scenes, if you like, um, which is very difficult for the media to capture until after it's happened. There are WhatsApp groups or Facebook pages where young Palestinians are reading about incidents and reading about attacks and, and they've said they've felt inspired to carry out attacks because of what they've read and the media isn't always seeing that. What we're seeing are reports of attacks as they take place and then these videos quickly emerging from uh, social media and then we, t we pick up the story from that point. And so there's just a, a sheer volume of, and speed of news and reporting now that, that, that there never was before. And for consumers, for average everyday civilians, that can create a kind of a, a den of news, a, a kind of overwhelming amount of information to process. Some are calling this the third intifada. The first started in 1987, the second began in 2000. Because those revolts appeared to be spontaneous, even random, and largely beyond the control of Palestinian authorities, news organizations found them challenging to cover. And the coverage of the current revolt simply does not square with the numbers. Al Jazeera has compiled the figures and reports that in the first three weeks of October, eight Israelis were killed by Palestinians in knife and gun attacks, compared to 52 Palestinians killed by Israeli forces. Despite all the free video content that both sides are providing with their phones, accuracy and proportionality have once again escaped the mainstream media's reporting of this story. It's important to remember that, that uh, despite the immediacy of, of cell phones, you are seeing this through filters, um, especially when, when the, the social media is picked up by traditional media. They're making, making choices about what is important. 
in what Israel's political leaders are calling a wave of terrorism. And this has come back to the nightly newscast because Palestinians are attacking Israelis. Attacks over the past month have claimed the lives of nine Israelis. The more routine violence of Israelis against Palestinians is not considered newsworthy in the same way. Um, and over the last six years, according to B'Tselem, which is the leading Israeli human rights group, there have been 25 times as many Palestinians killed by Israelis as Israelis killed by Palestinians. The global media tends to treat um, uh, Israeli violence against Palestinians almost as background noise. I mean, there was a whole series of killings and summary executions and so on of Palestinians throughout the past year, and it barely registered. Then all of a sudden, when individual Palestinians began randomly stabbing, if you will, um, uh, Israelis in, in Jerusalem and also within Israel, all of a sudden it was all over the headlines. And if the mainstream media seem reluctant to examine even the recent context, they appear to have an aversion to providing the historical context, that the Israeli occupation in all of its forms of Palestinian land has now lasted almost five decades. You need to have context, but I mean, eventually, you know, you can go back to 1948, you can go back to 1900, you can go back to the first Aliyah. At some point, you can't cover every single base on Earth. I think in terms of um, what's going on in East Jerusalem, certainly you should talk about what's going on elsewhere in the West Bank and everywhere else. Certainly the, the occupation needs to be spoken about, but you're never really going to please people who have um, a certain very strong uh, vested side in it. The dominant media, media narrative, it's presenting this as yet another cycle of violence between two conflicting parties and really leaving out the larger context of um, that this is a conflict between occupied uh, and, and occupier. So there's a very clear colonial context and framework to this conflict that is, in my view, all too often ignored in media coverage, which um, tends to focus much more on, let's say, specific incidents and so on. Well, the context is an eternally difficult problem. You know, Journalists have maybe seven or eight hundred words to write a story, a TV package that may last a minute and a half or two minutes. And so it's very difficult always to provide uh, sufficient context to explain both sides. And, and so you have to pick your moments, uh, you have to pick your paragraphs, if you like, your phrases of context uh, wisely and try to make sure that they are relevant in the, in the, in the current um, circumstances. I don't think you need to have a uh a lengthy history lesson in every article, but the political reality does need to be addressed on a regular basis so that people understand what the fight is about. Because there is a, a difference between killing people because you are under occupation and killing people because you are occupying them. I mean, it would be a little bit like covering demonstrations in South Africa in the 1980s without consistently mentioning that this is taking place in the context of a struggle um, to end apartheid. And much too often, you do see that here. And more often than not, that is presented in a way that creates more sympathy for the Israeli occupier than for the occupied Palestinians. Between the two are the messengers trying not to get caught in the crossfire of a dangerous and developing story that's being turbocharged and possibly escalated by social media. And that was before a Palestinian wearing a press jacket pulled a knife on an Israeli soldier, an attack that will undoubtedly have an effect on the army's dealings with legitimate journalists, which were already at issue. Just in recent weeks, we had, there were two journalists from AFP who were attacked by Israeli troops. It was caught on camera, their equipment uh, destroyed. So that recent case in which a Palestinian uh, attacker disguised themselves as a member of the press and then attempting to stab an Israeli soldier has only made this relationship between the media and the Israeli security forces even more difficult as they're going to be very much on edge as a result of that. On the download now, our viewers weigh in on the way the Palestine-Israel conflict is covered. The correspondents uh, on the ground have been doing a reasonable job of 
um, getting the information to their bureaus. What is of tremendous concern to many Israelis is the way in which those articles are then framed. There's a, a great deal of emphasis put on the response by Israeli policemen to Palestinians who perpetrated acts of violence against Israelis, but very little discussion of the acts of violence themselves. We are talking about one of the most complicated conflicts in the world, so if there's not enough context given in news reports, facts are missed and information is automatically distorted. An outsider is going to see angry Palestinians thrown rocks without hearing about violence from the Israeli side. Palestinians are then automatically the aggressors. Other media stories that are on our radar this week, press freedom groups are calling for the release of a journalist in China who is being held without charge after being accused of obtaining state secrets. Liu Wei is the deputy editor at Southern Metropolis, a daily paper known for its investigative reporting based in the city of Guangzhou. Liu reported extensively on a murder allegedly committed by a prominent public figure named Wang Lin. He had published documents leaked by Lin's wife. His work on the case seems to have irked Chinese authorities. Southern Metropolis issued a statement to other media outlets supporting Liu. However, the paper did not publish the statement on its website or other platforms. The U.S.-based Committee to Protect Journalists said China is criminalizing basic reporting. The government's interpretation of state secrets has grown so broad that it now encompasses routine criminal justice matters. The CPJ also quoted a colleague of Liu's at Southern Metropolis who asked to remain anonymous. He reportedly said of the paper, the company showed some backbone for putting out the statement, but it is not strong enough. It would be better if it publicized it on our own various platforms. In Ethiopia, there's been a development in the case of the Zone 9 bloggers. Zone 9 is a political and social commentary blog, often critical of the government in Addis Ababa. A year and a half ago, nine contributors were jailed on terrorism-related charges. Five of them were released three months ago, and a court in the capital has just acquitted the remaining four on the terror charges. This case drew international attention, with critics accusing the government of trying to stifle press freedom and intimidate independent voices. At least 17 more Ethiopian journalists remain behind bars. The Paris-based Reporters Without Borders said these bloggers should never have been arrested and should never have spent 539 days in preventive detention. We urge the judicial authorities to compensate them for their unjustified detention. The bloggers used the Zone 9 site to report on social and political issues, and they called on young Ethiopians to demand their legal rights and push the government to practice democracy. The United Arab Emirates has been accused of paying a British public relations firm millions of dollars to spread negative news in the UK about its opponents, including the government of Qatar. According to a story published by the UK's Mail on Sunday, which the paper says was based on leaks from a whistleblower, the UAE paid a London-based PR firm called Quiller about $100,000 a month over a six-year period. The report says that the firm's job was to promote and achieve the foreign policy objectives of the UAE and that all the activities will be carried out in strict confidence. Quiller is partly owned by Peter Gummer, a close associate of Prime Minister David Cameron. The documents and emails reveal how journalists with British newspapers and the BBC were among those given material to include in their stories. The Daily Telegraph's Andrew Gilligan wrote a number of articles last year accusing Qatar of funding terrorism. And according to the emails, when one of the stories came out, UAE officials were sent emails assuring them that the stories were a product of Quiller's PR push and that more would follow. The Mail also names Robert Mendick of the Sunday Telegraph for having written articles about Qatar at Quiller's suggestion. Quiller's client list no longer includes the UAE, and those named in the story, including Gummer, otherwise known as Lord Chadlington, have either denied involvement or refused to comment. Regular viewers will know that here at The Listening Post, we're all about the narrative. We report on dominant narratives, alternative narratives, and governments trying to control the news narrative. Narrative is defined as a story or account of events, experiences, or the like, whether true or fictitious. And when media outlets report the news, they often present versions of the world by packaging events and characters into some kind of narrative. They call them stories. Many of those stories are based on a simple storytelling device, binaries, stories organized around oppositions, good guys, bad guys, freedom, tyranny, 
the civilized versus the barbaric. The list is long, the issues are varied. However, the common element in them is they privilege one term over the other. They produce a hierarchy of value. Often, the mainstream news media merely reinforce binaries that are offered up by the dominant political discourse, George W. Bush's post-9-11 speech, and that idea that you're either with us or against us grew into one of the biggest binaries of them all, the global war on terror. The Listening Post's Marcella Pizarro now on the language and imagery of binaries, how they shape news stories, how those stories construct our worldviews, and what those binary narratives leave out. Us. Yep. Them. <laughs> Heroes. Easy, miss. I've got you. Villains. Bring back her heart. From the word go, the way we are taught to understand the world is through stories of good and evil. From Disney cartoons. Every eligible maiden is to attend. To Hollywood sci-fi. I'll never turn to the dark side. From the Wild West. When you have to shoot, shoot, don't talk. To the Middle East. I had to slit a few throats, but I got it. To news. The brutal tyrant who ruled Iraq. The murderous Islamic State militant group. Catching Zarqawi, the number one bad guy in country. Binary oppositions are everywhere to be seen in news reporting. We find them every time in when we open a newspaper or when we switch on television. We always find you know, that there is a conflict going on somewhere. The West against Russia, Putin against Obama. News reporting is about conflicts and therefore it is often about binary oppositions. It's really important to, to think about the ways in which stories are constructed in terms of binary oppositions which are not actually real, they're just ways of organising a story. But we could understand the world in different ways, in more nuanced ways. Binaries work in terms of privileging a, a particular aspect of the discourse in contrast to another aspect. They cut out vast chunks of experience in order to produce that kind of meaning. After the September 11th attacks, US President George W. Bush famously announced Either you are with us, or you are with the terrorists. The primer, the skeleton script had been written for that binary epic of our times, the global war on terror. The media creates narratives and reinforces narratives. So in a sense, there's a collusion between political leaders and the media that reports upon them. America strikes back. In the history of Iraq, a dark and painful era is over. And that collusion creates shared narratives that then become accepted as common sense by viewers and listeners of the media. In the post-9-11 scenario, the news media produce the narrative of you know, the West versus, West versus Islam, where Islam is seen as outside of the West. The strict vision of Islam was unleashed with amputations, stoning for adultery. The way in which it was done was by constantly emphasizing the difference in, in war views that supposedly uh, were held by, by Islamic actors. The leader of an atavistic strand of Islam that took much of Afghanistan back decades. Kind of explicit enemies of, of the war on terror, starting from bin Laden and Al-Qaeda and other groups America was fighting against. The, the first binary, of course, is that um, there is this difference between terrorism. It was aimed at ordinary people using the tube, using a bus service. And state-sponsored military action. Operation Iraqi Freedom. Now both are forms of political violence actually. And the, the fact that one is seen as completely unconnected to the other is an ideological construct. But of course the whole purpose of the binary was to associate terrorism with a particular cultural or civilizational framework. On January the 7th, 2015, when gunmen attacked the satirical magazine Charlie Hebdo, killing 11 journalists there, the binary template was already there, ready to be fitted into a new story about us versus them, to be or not to be Charlie. Free speech becomes a, a kind of standoff between those who are completely for free speech and those who are anti it. Now that's a construction because most people understand that there's a vast space in the middle where we actually have to do some serious thinking and some moral questioning about what the limits of free speech are and 
uh, how they should be defined and who gets to define them and so on. And the kind of narrative that dominated news media coverage on this event uh, mainly revolved around uh, presenting you know, Islam as a kind of common front that is somehow inherently opposed to the West, to civilization. Face à eux, désarmés, des dessinateurs, des éditorialistes amoureux de la liberté, de l'insolence et de, de la démocratie, les tueurs les ont abattus un à un pour détruire un symbole. Et pour... While, in fact, in that story, there was a question that had to do with the conflict or the contradiction between freedom of expression and respect for minorities. But binaries are not just born out of ideology. When you work in the world of 24-hour news, deadlines demand dichotomies. Stories need to be simple and fast. And then there's the economics of it. Nuance is not always a luxury an editor can afford because it takes research, investigation, and that costs money. The trouble is polarities elevate one side only to relegate the other. The most recent case in point, the story of thousands trying to get into Europe, a story told in terms of us and the other. The migrants. Comme chaque nuit depuis des semaines, la police est restée mobilisée pour empêcher le passage de clandestins. Until recently, when some news outlets, including this one, called time on the word migrant, an umbrella term deemed dehumanizing, and opting for the word refugee instead. It took the image of Alan Kurdi's drowned corpse to shift terminology more widely, but the binary was not dispensed with, it was just inverted. Before, um, the island photograph, we had um, migrants who were definitely the them in the story of us and them. The story then shifted and news outlets started calling the migrants refugees. And ostensibly this was a positive development because refugees was a much more sympathetic category. But that in turn, in a quite um, a below the radar, insidious kind of way, set up another binary opposition, an implicit binary opposition, between refugees claiming asylum, the good refugees, defined in opposition to the implicitly bad economic migrants. Just reversing the, the, the binary doesn't actually deconstruct the structure, it, it keeps it in place. And it surely has to be the role of journalism to challenge that, to critique that, and to say, you know, our practices are part of this problem. We are complicit in it, and we need to challenge that whole assumption that just in order to make something easily understandable is enough. It's really important to think about the news as a text, as a story that's constructed by producers and reporters, but it's also constructed by us as the audience, because we expect certain stories that are then told to us. And so we have to acknowledge the role that we play as consumers of news. Because stories of conflict are what we as viewers have been conditioned to expect, what we as news consumers have come to demand. So when outlets deliver news, neatly packaged into tidy binaries, they're just telling us what we want to hear, what we think we need to know. And finally, we'll end the program where we began, with the binary that is the Middle East conflict. Supporters on both sides have been flooding social media with images to help their cause. They do share a common complaint, though, that the media is biased against their side. A slew of political cartoons has been circulating, some current, some rehashed, some strategically edited, accusing various news outlets of favoring one side of the story. We've put together a short montage of some of the cartoons that are making the rounds in the blogosphere to give you an idea of the kind of news coverage that both sides oppose. We'll see you next time here at The Listening Post.